Kia ora and welcome to another episode of Rural New Zealand, proudly brought to you by Carfields. I'm your host, Scotty Manford. Join me as we check out what's happening throughout Canterbury. Alrighty, on this week's episode, Iron Man 4x4 will show off some must-have accessories. We visit an alpaca stud farm in North Canterbury. We sample a day in the life of an arable specialist. But first, it's off to Culverton to the Christmas country fate. Every year in the last weekend of October, the Christmas Country Fete is held in Colverton. Now in its 25th year and with over 200 stalls, it's certainly cemented its place as the best fete in New Zealand. Well, we're in our 25th year and yeah, 25 years ago it was started by four ladies whose um, husbands were farmers and you know job opportunities are few and far between up here so they sort of thought what business opportunity can they do and started up and it's really snowballed into you know, getting bigger and bigger each year into, into what we have today. Yeah, and sort of the original numbers, what were they compared to nowadays? I think, it was a, I think we had about, they had about 20 stalls and you know, a few hundred people and yeah, to now we have around between five and 6,000 in the day. How long does it take to sort of organise an event like this? Obviously the whole year probably? Yeah. People think it's, um, it can be easy, but no, it's a whole year job. Um, it, you know, we have peaks and troughs, but yeah, so you know, we have a bit of a break over the Christmas period, and then yeah, the last few months have been um, yeah, pretty crazy busy. So. Yeah. And it's a pretty idyllic setting, is it? Makes it yeah, <laughs> that's part of it. Um, I live in, in the homestead, so it takes a bit of pressure on the garden, and the boys um, you know, have to make sure that the animals graze it at the right time, so and then we have the trees pruned and everything, but it's all part of the setting and we get a lot of city people out from town and we've got, you know, country comes to town for the show week and this is the opposite. So the city people come out and, you know, we're only a short distance from Christchurch, but, you know, can experience some country life. With so many stools on offer, I thought it was time to check them all out. How much effort goes into making these fine works of art here? Heaps. Absolutely heaps. And how long have you been coming to the fate for? Uh, I've been doing this five or six years now. Yeah, you really enjoy it? I love it. Best in New Zealand. I hear there's quite a buzz with Manuka honey. I discovered some stools have a wide range of products. What creations have I got? I've got the barbecue easy. And I make a short one for the girls that refuse to barbecue. Kebab tools, the old-fashioned potato mashers. Old people that can't open the hot water bottles. Plastic bag carriers. Carry the wine glasses. Everything covered. I go. From the range of stools, some people have travelled a fair way. Yeah. Whereabouts do you make these in New Zealand? Uh, down in Wanaka. Oh yeah? yeah. yeah. Do you travel a wee way? We have, yep, yeah. yep. So picking up at 4pm and probably get home around 2am I think. Oh, yeah. It's worth it though, do you enjoy the fate? Oh for sure, yeah. Yeah, beautiful atmosphere and yeah, fantastic. So. For some stools it was their first and others have seen the fate grow. And it's your first time in the fate, are you first, enjoying it? First time and I was here many, many moons ago but yeah, loving it. Yeah. We're having a fabulous time. Good, good responses from the public? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Says it all actually. You've been here a few times? I've been here every time. Oh wow. I'm beginning. cutting the cake at two o'clock. Oh awesome. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Such a privilege. Yeah, yeah. It's such a privilege. Uh, so you've obviously seen the, the natural grow over the years and oh. When it first started, it was just a little thing for friends to come and buy some Christmas decorations and presents. And now, of course, it's the major fate in the country. With all this walking around, I had to get amongst the food and beverages. Tell me about the lemonade. So, this is 100% New Zealand product. Mm -hmm. We make it ourselves in Nelson, so there's no concentrates, preservatives, additives, or artificials. Oh, that's actually really good. Yeah. Thank you. Good you I'm not even saying that to be on camera, that's actually yeah. really nice. <laughs> So popular, that one there. This is really nice. Oh, one's got a bit of bite to the, the tail one. I sound like a connoisseur chef, but I know nothing about food. How popular are the uh, ice creams today? Very popular. So what's been the favourite? Uh, for the kids, strawberry marshmallow, definitely. And for the, the adults? adults? Salted caramel. Oh, yes, yes. Alrighty, uh, it's a beautiful sunny day. It's time to have some salted caramel ice cream. Let's see how this goes. It's nice and chewy, I like that. I'm gonna flick this off if I'm not careful. Oh mate, you need to get off that camera and you're going to try some of this. There was even talks through the day, so I thought I'd do one myself, but no one was interested. With so many different stools, the selection process must certainly be challenging. Um, basically we have a thorough selection process, so we receive applications in May and then we take um, what we consider our best storeholders that apply. There's usually 
quite a few hundred, so it's quite a serious process and takes some time. Um, basically we have a huge range from all over the country, um, from all types of stalls, so we've got babies, kids, garden, plants, clothing, accessories, you name it, it's here. So um, yeah, lots of options for people, but yeah, we try and get a really good selection. Yeah. Um, With people travelling from all over New Zealand, I asked them what they love about the fete. It's wonderful. It's, it's a great annual time. event. Now I've been here uh, three times in the last five years, and it's just a great atmosphere. Brenda, how have you enjoyed the fete today? Wonderful day, thank you. Is this mm. your first time? No, uh, probably third or fourth. And how does it stack up compared to the other ones? Oh, it's pretty good. It's been lovely, really good. Have you been here a few times before? I haven't. No, no. first time. First, first time here. Yeah. It couldn't be a better day. Could it? Primo, it's primo yeah. indeed. What have we enjoyed about the fate today? Oh, everything. The weather, mostly. Um, lots of great stuff to buy. Yeah. yeah what's been the best purchase so far? Uh, my new necklace, actually. Yeah, it's very nice, it's actually. Pretty nice, eh? Oh, I like it. I like yeah, it. I like it too. It's not a very manly thing to say, no. but it's nice. You're nice. in touch with your feminine side. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I was enjoyed about the fake. Oh, really? Yeah. The pims. The pims. pims. Yeah, the pims. Yes, pims. <laughs> and what kind of things did you buy? Um, oh, lots of little goodies, nuts. condiments. Yep. Well that's us from the Fate for 2016, it's been an absolutely gorgeous day. There's plenty of things on offer but uh, I think I've had a great day and I'm pretty sure all the punters have too. So we'll have to see you next year for 2017. It's cool that the Fate made it to 25 and it's definitely a cool day that I would recommend to everyone. Stay tuned on Rural New Zealand as we check over some crops with an arable specialist. See you guys then. Welcome back to Rural New Zealand. A few weeks ago we caught up with Kate Kircher. We tagged along and did her day-to-day -day role at Carfield's Grain and Seed. Well, I'm an arable specialist, so we contract crops such as this turnip crop with growers and we, so right from the start we sign the contract with them, we, um, they select a paddock, we help them with that just to get the right paddock for the right crop. We then get the seed organised and when it comes time to the sowing, whatever time, whether it's spring or autumn, we help them with putting it in the ground. They do it themselves but we, we can, um, we're there to answer any questions that they have on that and get the seed to them and then once it's in the ground or even just before we sort out all the um, herbicides if any need to go on and then from there we manage the crop with the grower right throughout the growing season, right from when it goes in the ground, also once signing the contract right through to harvest and then even after harvest when it gets into the store if there's any problems which generally there's not but if there's anything and then yeah so it's a pretty long process but um, so day to day come out look at crops like this and see how they're tracking we've got to take notes on them on our tablets we've got crop notes that we have to keep up to date every every couple of weeks sort of thing just for our overseas customers that's a way that we can let them know that their crops that we're growing for them is they're on track. First on the list of crops to check was the turnip seed. It had just started flowering a week ago. So there seems to be quite a lot of bee action going on. Yeah, well the farmers just put the bee hives over on either side around the crop just to, we need the bees in here to help pollinate and fertilise the flowers to produce the pods which will produce us the seed. Pretty much what we're looking for at the moment, everything else we've done earlier in the um, piece, we've did, done the herbicide sprays, we've put all the nutrition on, all the fertiliser, foliar fertilisers, fungicides, we've done them all before now. Um, this time of the year we pretty much just let them flower and just yeah, keep an eye out for any bugs or anything that we don't want in the crop. So yeah, pretty much at this time of the year we just make sure that there's no aphids getting right into the head here. Um, these flowers, each flower will produce a pod, which once we're through flowering a little bit more, there'll be the flowers will disappear and a pod will um, end up on the end of here. So we just don't want any aphids getting in the flowers and eating any of these new flowers that are coming through. And how often would you come out and sort of check the paddocks? Um, this time of the year we try to keep a close eye on them just because it is the crucial timing. So every 10 days sort of, um, sometimes it might be more or less, but every 10 days is a good good aim to keep an eye on them and just we don't want anything to creep in because things can come in quite fast, especially diseases and 
bugs. It doesn't take long for them to come in and destroy a crop. How many seeds would be on each plant? A lot. <laughs> in short, a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, yeah, you can see the multiple. Like. Yeah, I mean, one, one plant doesn't just have that top, but there's flowers coming from down here, which they will produce pods as well. Yeah. Right down. And yeah, I mean, we're only early flowering now. It might look like there's a lot of flowers, but this is only early flowering. Yeah. There's no, you can't actually see any pods yet, so it just means that these flowers have only just opened, and these ones haven't even opened yet at all. With a short drive just down the road, we checked out another one of Kate's crops that she is monitoring. Okay, do you want to tell us about the, the grass in this paddock we've got here? Um, so this is a meadow fescue paddock which was sown in February, or earlier this year, February, March. Yeah, sowed down and we've probably sprayed. The only thing we've really done to it this year is a couple of herbicides over it, um, just to clean up the weeds. This paddock, will, well this crop will be a two, possibly three year crop, so as long as we get the weeds out in the first year that's the main thing. Yeah, this is, it's just starting to take off now, a um, bit of spring growth and be looking to put a fungicide and a plant growth reg regulator over it um, in the next week or two and then it'll be away racing we'll start to see some ears coming out and the seeds starting to appear and before we know it we'll be harvesting it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the time in Kate's day is spent travelling as she covers a large area. So my area is pretty much from Rakai River, so Selwyn district north and also do some over the other side of the Waimak and have a few clients around Pendarvis below Rakai. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty big area with our um, headquarters being in Ashburton. There's a lot of travelling. Um, our chemical comes out of our Ashburton store, so picking up chemical every week and dropping it up to clients around the Selwyn district and over the Waimak district, it's a lot, of, a lot of Ks in a week. Where do you sort of see the future of cropping in New Zealand? Um, it's definitely going forward. We're, it's probably a bit of a halt at the moment with the way that you, all the markets are and overseas, but there's definitely a lot more opportunities um, for growers and the likes of ourselves to bring new crops here for growers to grow and make good margins out of. But you love your job though? Yes, definitely. Yep, no, I couldn't really think of anything I'd rather be doing. Um, definitely we have those days where we have to be in the office and they get a bit dreary, but you come out on a day like this and have a look at a crop like this, it's, yeah, kind of <laughs> speaks for itself really. Thanks for letting us tag along Kate and all the best for the future. Alrighty, stay tuned on Rural New Zealand as we check out an alpaca stud farm and we talk to Vince about wet weather options from Ironman 4x4. Welcome back to Rural New Zealand. With more and more alpacas popping up throughout Canterbury, I decided it was time to check out a stud farm and see what the fuss was all about. Well this actually is my, used to be farmed by my great grandparents and my grandparents. But then after my grandfather passed away, the farm was sold out of the family and subsequently subdivided into some lifestyle blocks. And so when we found this on the market, we were pretty excited about moving back to the old stomping ground. We first got involved in them because after we'd bought the property, uh, the children were looking for, looking on the web for a dog. They wanted to buy a dog, but as these websites do, they sort of shunt you from one to another to the next. And suddenly Charlotte said to me, here we are, Mum, this is what we should have, some alpacas. And we tracked some down and uh, bought our first few at auction here in New Zealand. And then Kit and I sort of went over to Australia to have a look at the show, one of the shows over there. and. The animals over there were, we thought they were better quality than the ones that were available in New Zealand, so we ended up buying seven, five or seven? Five. Seven, five, yeah. five, five. Five over there in Australia and brought them back to New Zealand. And uh, we've imported a few since then, we've exported a lot, and uh, yeah, just continue to enjoy them. And when did you sort of think, oh, let's start up our own stud? We didn't. <laughs> It just oh, happened, it, like most things in life, it just happened. Well, we did we did have an Ast a prominent yeah. Australian breeder yeah. over here, and he said, Kit, uh, have you got a business plan? And um, I to told him the scenario about the dog, uh, and he had a laugh, and he said, well, what are you? And uh, I said, oh, well, we've got a few alpacas, we're just having a bit of fun. And he said, yes, but what are you going to do with these animals? And it sort of got us thinking as to what we needed to do. And so 
yeah, we started calling ourselves Silver Stream Alpaca Stud, and initially we felt, felt it was a little bit pretentious, but as we've grown and done well, um, the, the name fits more uh, easily now. And uh, back in 2007, we went on to win Supreme Champion Animal of Show at the New Zealand Royal and beat 10,000 uh, other livestock, including horses and everything else. So after that, we thought, yeah, I guess we've uh, made it. This is uh, one of our Silver Stream uh, animals that are in the show team. As far as the fleece is concerned, we think this is uh, the type of fleece that we want to breed for. And I'll just open up just to give you an idea of what a, a beautiful alpaca fleece uh, can look like. The other thing is uniformity. We're trying to make sure that what we see here is the same everywhere. We have pre-sold our fibre pretty well before it's gone, uh, come off the animal's back and we can get anything up to $26 a kilo for our fine uh, white fibre and even the rough belly, lower legs, colours or whatever we can still get $5 a kilo all plus GST so there's a good good potential and uh, as I say that, that market's grown tremendously now we even have our own wee shop here for our Farms Day visitors here and they just love the fact that it's off our farm, that it's 100% alpaca. If you get that rare one that really does do the goods uh, uh, the money can be very good and uh, it will depend on the male and the market and be it local or international but males can sell for as cheap as $200 as a weather or as a pet right through to $30,000, $50,000, $100,000. We then started getting inquiries from overseas and uh, that's what led to us getting an exporter licence and setting up our own quarantine facility so in effect we could be a one-stop shop and from there we've exported over 700 animals. The thing which is making the alpaca so endearing to um, town, town folk moving out to the city and buying uh, lifestyle properties is their colour, their friendliness, they're a fairly low maintenance animal. There's still a few basic farm maintenance principles you've got to follow but generally they're a fairly low care, e easy maintenance uh, animal. It's good to see passion in alpaca farming. Alrighty farmers and 4x4 enthusiasts, we've got just the products for you from Ironman 4x4. So Vince, it's pretty wet down on the farm today and I believe you've got some products that will get you out of trouble if you need be. Absolutely, yeah. Well, you know, you don't want to be um, getting out on the farm and getting stuck somewhere and uh, having to spend the rest of the day walking home to get out. So what we've got is, um, it's a new product and it's called a tread, and it's a traction tread. So basically what they are is um, a couple of uh, plastic boards that you actually stick under your tyres and um, use to get you out of a, a mud hole or when your truck's stuck in sand or something like that. Tread pattern's on the front, so what that does is when you feed that in under the tyre, it actually digs in and gives something for the tyre treads to, to dig into. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you don't want it to just fire out the back of the truck. So on the back side of it, it actually has a, a series of um, grips as well. So that there, combined with the, the tyre pulling it under, and those grips on the back actually lodge it on the ground. Mm -hmm. And basically, yeah, you can use them to, uh, to dig yourself out of a hole. So these, um, these treads are about 1,100 long. They've got a, a lifetime warranty on them. And you've also got some more options yeah. that are even handier. What we've got here is a, one of our large recovery kits. Yep. So we do a couple of different size recovery kits. We do a, a small and a large one, but this is a large one. Um, again, great to have in the back of the truck uh, for any, any sort of situation where you might get stuck. It's just got pretty much everything you need. This is what we call a, a snatch strap. So basically it's nine metres long um, and it's rated for eight tonne. And what it is, it's actually made out of 100% um, nylon and it has a, a stretch factor in it and they say it's about 20% stretch. Mm -hmm. So what these products do is, is you use the kinetic energy of um, one truck to pull out another truck basically. So you connect up to one truck and then the back one and then you back her up and then you basically floor it. Yeah. And then the, the, the sexual product just stretches and then it contracts and the bungee pulls out the second truck. So um, very, very effective. We do those in a couple of sizes, uh, an eight ton, 11 ton, so uh, very good. But of course you do need the second vehicle to get you out with those. Yeah. Um, another uh, little product here is, is basically an, an extension strap. 
so this one's 20 metres long so um, again really useful if you're uh, winching or if you have a vehicle that's stuck in a river and you don't want to get too close to it obviously get the, the towing vehicle stuck as well so this is just giving you another 20 metres of stretch basically. Uh, the other final strap that's in the in the kit is just basically a tree trunk protector um, so it's um, it's quite a wide looking one and it's not very long it's only about three metres long and the idea of that is that if you um, have to use a tree or something to, to recover yourself off or um, as an anchor point that you can use this around it without damaging the trees. We don't normally use chains for recovering vehicles because they, um, they there's not a lot of forgiveness in them um, but great for um, moving things off tracks and things like that so if you had a, if you're out on a track and there was a tree falling across the track um, obviously you know you don't want to drag your good straps through the ground and damage them and things like that so this is where the old snake chain's brilliant. Also in the kit there's a couple of uh, bow shackles so we can use these for uh, any application really good with uh, obviously with your straps so these are rated at uh, four and three quarters tons so nice and strong um, so yeah if you're uh, connecting that you know to your tree or to your vehicle um, using your bow shackles is the way to go. The old gloves they're basically in there to uh, protect your hands. For soft people like me pretty much. Not if you haven't done much work lately and you spend a bit of time in the office you might want to be wearing your gloves on a job like this. And then the last thing that we've got in the uh, in the recovery kit is a uh, what they call a snatch block so this is um, specifically designed for winching so when you uh, if you take your winch out of your vehicle and connect it to something sometimes you might not have enough pull um, basically what this does is you run your winch rope through there and back to the vehicle and it, it actually doubles your, your purchase or your pulling power of your winch so um, say our, our winches are about five ton um, if you find you just can't get out on a single line you can double that back and back to the vehicle hook that to a tree and you actually get 10 ton of pulling power Primo. Yeah. Sounds like you got all bases covered. Yeah, so yeah, no, it makes for a fantastic little uh, recovery kit to have in the back of your truck. Well, thanks for joining us today on Rural New Zealand. I certainly hope you enjoyed the show. Just remember to give us a like on Facebook, and if you're silly enough to miss an episode, you can watch it on demand. Catch you guys next week as we meet a dairy farmer who loves getting off the farm and competes in fashion events at the races here in New Zealand and Australia. See you guys then.